in a, a time when we're thinking of uniting our hearts in fellowship around the communion table, uh, I wonder if you'd turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53, and I want to bring a message tonight concerning what God has provided for us in the atonement. There isn't a Christian here that hasn't been taught that Jesus died for our sins. What the emphasis today needs to be is that he has provided for us a full redemption and it's nowhere more clearly illustrated than in the monumental chapter, the classic chapter on the crucifixion, Isaiah 53. I'm reading from the King James, so I'll freely translate uh, the literal Hebrew when it's necessary. Otherwise, I'll just leave it. I just want to read the first five verses. And the reason you have to translate the Hebrew is because uh, there wouldn't be much point in giving a message tonight on divine healing except we see it's provided here. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Speaking of Christ, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of pains and acquainted with sickness, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our diseases, and he hath carried away our pains. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Oh, it's a blessed thing to hear of healing of the body five times. I'm glad he said, too, of course, the healing of the body wouldn't mean much, that he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that five different times here we're told of physical bodily healing. And it's God's desire in this hour <clears throat> in which we live to deliver us from all ignorance concerning what he's provided for us at Calvary. Nothing displeases the Father more than for us to partake of the bread and cup by which he provided a full redemption and to have us limit it just to the forgiveness of sins. That's a wonderful thing to have forgiveness of sins. I had that for 14 years, but... It was, a, it was even a greater blessing to learn about eight years ago how that I had a full redemption uh, promise, provided and promised to me in the Word of God. In spite of the fact that the contemporary church taught me and is still teaching its people that the atonement for this dispensation is limited to the healing of sins, spiritual sickness, nevertheless anyone who can read can see that healing is provided here in the atonement. Uh, Matthew 8, 16 and 17 plainly says the same thing. He refers to Isaiah, Matthew, in quoting this passage. He refers to Isaiah in 53 and says, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This was even before Calvary. He was already applying that atonement to those who came to him in faith. Anyone who can read can see that God has set gifts of healing in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says he set in the church first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, and then gifts of healings. Set in the church. So as long as the church exists, then these ministries and gifts will exist. He tells us in Mark 16 to go preach the gospel to every creature, and he says these signs will follow those who believe who preach that gospel, if they preach the gospel fully, he says they will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, among other things, other signs that they will perform. He tells us throughout his word that he's provided healing in this atonement, which we celebrate tonight with these emblems of the bread and the cup, the bread and the wine. And James 5 is a precious promise. Although I often feel like quoting it the way most uh, Christians today believe it, we're told in James, is there any sick among you? Let him call for what? 
Why call for the doctors? And, <laughs> Is any sick among you, let him call for the doctors and let him anoint him with an injection of penicillin. <laughs> In the name of medical science. And medicine shall heal the sick and the doctor will raise him up. Well, that isn't what James said. He said, is any sick among you, let him call for the church. Healing has been deposited in the church. Amen. It's a part of our reservoir of blessings to one another and to the world. Let him call for the elders in the church. Let the elders pray over him. Anoint him with oil and pray in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will heal the sick. And the Lord, not medical science, will raise him up. Well, it couldn't be any plainer than that to me. For 14 years, all I ever heard before becoming charismatic is what God isn't doing today. Uh, the age of miracles has passed that God now heals through medical science and medicine. But you won't read very long. You won't have to study very long until you find that what most of what the church is teaching today along this line is just not based upon the Scriptures at all. And Christian, today you're going to have to start, if you haven't already, you're going to have to start choosing between man's teaching and God's teaching. You're going to have to base your faith on one of two things, either what God has said or what man has said. A long time ago, I made the choice, and I haven't regretted it. I'm willing to believe what God has said he will do. When I can understand it, I, I'm willing to believe that God is faithful to fulfill it. But you won't have to study very long until you discover man has substituted uh, 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 organization and religious programs for the power of the Holy Spirit, substituted education and human talent and ability uh, for the ministries of the church, the gifts of the Spirit, that they've substituted medical science for divine healing and this sort of thing. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1, he says, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. And then he begins to tell us about the things that God has said in the church. Uh, one of the things he says are the gifts of healings and the ministry of healing that he's put in his church and it's to be there. He doesn't want us to be ignorant about this and yet we must confess without criticizing, we must confess that most of the church today is almost totally ignorant of what God has provided for it, what its inheritance rights are. And they have developed a sickness theology. Uh, they believe in divine sickness instead of divine healing and divine health. And they, 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 they have devised a neat little system of proof text to prove why they should always be sick, just half alive, and always in need. And they really think they're brilliant because they can quote some alleged proof text to prove why they don't have anything. And, and it's astounding to me, I just stand in amazement, uh, when the devil is doing so much damage to 99% of the Christians, mentally, physically, spiritually, materially, in every way, he's got them bound up. They can't even fulfill the commission because they don't believe in the methods of getting it fulfilled. He's doing so much damage to the church today, and yet they run around with these little smiles on their faces like, you know, oh, we're really sharp because we have memorized two or three texts to prove why we should always be sick half alive and poverty-stricken. And they seem to be almost totally ignorant of the significance of what they're doing, going to the Word to prove why they don't have anything and why they're oppressed of the devil. The only thing I can compare it to is a story I was told by someone I don't want to give their name about an incident. It isn't true, but it illustrates my, my dilemma with contemporary church. At this point, and this individual told me about the man who pulled his car into a parking lot, and as he stepped out, a group of hoodlums rushed up, and one punched him in the nose and took his wallet, took his money, and then another took a piece of chalk out of his pocket and drew a circle right around him, about three foot in diameter, and said, if you get outside that circle till we get done with robbing your car and all, we'll beat you within an inch of your life. And uh, so they drew the circle of chalk around him, proceed to go over to his car and get in his luggage, take what they want, scatter the rest. Uh, I think he was driving a VW and one had a sledgehammer and he smashed the windshield and the lights out and beat the roof in and the hood and just about leveled it to the ground as they started to leave. <laughs> this fellow began to cackle and laugh. 
after they'd done all this to him, they said, what in the world are you laughing about? We punched in the nose, robbed you, scattered your luggage, we destroyed your car. What in the world have you got to laugh about? He said, he said I stepped outside the circle three times when you weren't looking. <laughs> talk about missing the point. <laughs> and that's what comes to my mind when I think of the terrible, <laughs> the ignorance of contemporary Christians who run around thinking they're so smart because they've got some alleged proof text for why they're sick and diseased and poverty stricken and oppressed of the devil. They don't seem to comprehend the significance of what they're saying or doing, because if God has provided these things for them and promised them to, to them in his word, and, and there isn't a verse in the Bible that says they're not for this age or not available to the Christian and so forth, if he's provided them, then we're finding proof text to prove we shouldn't have them. We're like the man who thought he'd really accomplished something because he had fooled them and stepped outside the circle and lost everything in the process. Well... Praise God. It helps. It keeps me from crying when I think of that. Uh, <clears throat> if you can laugh, you, you don't cry over the uh, dilemma of the contemporary church. Uh, praise the Lord. Some of us are starting to believe that we can step outside the circle and uh, claim what belongs to us. Amen. Well, praise God, there is a place in Christ that provides for us everything now, here and now, we can, can begin to enter into what Christ has made available in, in the atonement. We can begin to enter into it now by faith. There are three common errors which have no basis in Scripture that I'd like to share with you tonight before we partake of the communion. Uh, having to do with divine healing, three common errors held by most Christians, I suppose, uh, and those errors which have no basis in Scripture are one, that sickness glorifies God. I want to go on record by saying that sickness never glorifies God. Amen. And you, I challenge you to find a verse of Scripture that ever says sickness is sent by God for His glory. And secondly, the error that God is the source of sickness. And I want to go on record by saying that God does ha has no sickness in heaven to send on you. God is never the source of sickness. Now, I hope you stay through the whole message because we'll tell you, we'll answer those question marks that are already uh, arising in some of your minds. And thirdly, the common error that God generally does not perform a miracle, to heal, that when God heals, he's healing today through medical science, medical drugs, medicines, and surgery, and the like. Occasionally, about 1%, maybe 2% of the time, God does perform a miracle. You can't rule out miracles, Christians say, but generally, 98% of the time, he has other methods and other means today. Well, I, I contend that all three of those are, uh, are fallacies that have no basis in Scripture. The contention that sickness glorifies God is ruled out by the fact that if it did, then Jesus and the apostles went about robbing God of his glory all the time. Because we're told that Jesus healed all who were sick. He was constantly robbing God of his glory if sickness glorifies God. A Christian who believes that, who says he believes that, should never go to a doctor, should never take a pill. And yet, every one of them who say that God sends sickness for his, our good and his glory seek at the fastest, most immediate possible moment to remove that blessing that God has put on them <laughs> so that they can no longer glorify God. I mean, they really believe down deep sickness is an evil to be gotten rid of. They've been taught it's a blessing that it glorifies God, but they don't really believe that. Well, people say, what about John 11 in the case of Lazarus? And here we admit that there is a passage uh, that uses the term glory in respect to the death of Lazarus. And so here, uh, the contemporary Christian, most of them think they found the proof text for proving that God 
gets glory from sickness. A certain man was sick named Lazarus. John 11. Verse 3. Therefore, oh, excuse me. Verse 2. It was that Mary, which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, now listen to it. This is where they get the erroneous idea. He said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Period. Well, now if that ended chapter 11, uh, I still say it wouldn't prove what they contend, because you've got the rest of the Bible which contradicts it. But the fact is, he didn't stop there. And he went on to show what he meant by the fact that Lazarus' death would glorify God. Uh, he says, in fact, this sickness is not unto death, and Lazarus actually died. So he isn't talking about the fact that he wouldn't die. <coughs> He's talking back about the fact that he will die. And you don't find them there at the tomb praising God because Lazarus is dead. Oh, praise the Lord. He's getting a lot of glory. Let everybody rejoice. But they were weeping and sad. But when he raised him from the dead, then we have, another, we have another situation entirely. When Mary and Martha came to him and said, Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. Jesus said, verse 39, take you away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Now listen to Jesus. Jesus said unto her, saith unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Now you know what he's referring to. That if you'll believe it, then you'll see the glory of God. He hasn't seen the glory of God yet. The people haven't seen the glory of God yet because he's dead. But when he raises him in the tomb, God is going to be glorified. This is precisely the teaching all through the New Testament, like in Matthew 15 and verse 30. God gets glory through healing and through raising the dead. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Insomuch as the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be made whole, the lame to walk, the blind to see, and they glorified God. This is the way God gets glory from your healing, not your sickness. And it's ridiculous to contend to some do that, that God ever gets glory out of a person's sickness. You don't find these people bringing the lame and the maimed and the sick and the diseased and the demon-possessed, praising the Lord and saying, Hallelujah, we're going to get God's glory removed, they're going to get healed. Praise the Lord when in John 9 this... Man is born into the world blind. The disciples said, Who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. And Jesus said, Neither, but that the works of God might be made manifest. Or he, he might have even used the term glory there in John 9. You don't find those parents when he's born into the world blind saying, Praise the Lord, we've got a blind baby. Now look, if he lives to be 40, God will get 40 years of glory from this blind child. No, when Jesus opened his eyes, then God was glorified in the healing. Well, it may sound a little elementary to some of you old uh, stallards of the faith, but I want to tell you, <laughs> it isn't elementary to the most of the people uh, who are sitting in our churches, and a lot of you here tonight, I speak in love, show by the expression on your face that you have been brainwashed into believing that sickness glorifies God. And while it may seem a little elementary to some of us to say that God gets glorified through healing, that's precisely where the emphasis is in Scripture. Then the contention that, that sickness is from God is based upon a text in, um, well, several along this line, like Deuteronomy 7.15, that God is the author of sickness and that he puts diseases on people. Here in Deuteronomy 7.15 is the promise of the Lord. The Lord will take away, speaking to Israel, take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. And so there uh, uh, they contend, don't you see that we're plainly told that God put the evil diseases on those who were in Egypt and he promises that he'll put none of them on the Israelites if they will obey him. 
And so the contention is, the verse plainly says God put the diseases on the Egyptians, and he says he puts it on others in other passages. And my reply to that is, I agree 100%. That is exactly what he says. No one in this church, as far as I know, I never have, and as far as I know in this church, has ever denied that God doesn't put diseases on his enemies as judgment. The Word of God plainly says that he does. He sends all sorts of calamity, and disease is a part of it. This is precisely what the Word teaches. But the church today is teaching that disease is a blessing, whereas the Word of God always presents disease as a curse from the Lord, judgment from the Lord. Moreover, dear friends, it's not the same as saying because God sent it or allowed it or put it on them that he's the author of it. You see, that's another question entirely. You have no scripture at all that says God is the source of the sickness because he puts something on his enemies as judgment or allows it upon his own children at times as chastisement is not the same thing as saying God is the source of the disease or the adversity or the sickness. And the scriptures are very plain in telling us who is the source. Have you ever read the book of Job? God turned Job over to Satan. And we're told that Satan afflicted Job with the sore boils. We're told in Acts 10, 38, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Not blessed by God, but oppressed by the devil. And then if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, I want to show you clearly and unmistakably that God does not put sickness on people, though he will send it, but the source and author of sickness is always Satan. It comes from the powers of darkness. 1 Corinthians and chapter 5, here we have a case of fornication in the church, and Paul says it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Uh, here apparently is a, is a man who is fornicating with his stepmother. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that hath done this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now it could not be any plainer, dear friends, that the Apostle Paul directs the church to deliver a sinning, unrepentant, member over to the powers of darkness for the destruction of the flesh through some disease of some kind that he might be awakened in time. In 2 Corinthians there's a passage which shows that he did wake up and repented after they did this and they brought him back into fellowship. And that was the purpose of it. But the point is that the source of the sickness is the devil. Now I have a question for you. Did the church put the sickness on the man? Well, how could they? They have no sickness to put on. I don't have any sickness to put on you. They have no sickness to put on the man, but they can turn him over to the author of sickness, the one who has the power of sickness and death, Hebrews 2, and that is Satan. And that's exactly what Paul said to do. He says God's in the business of saving spirits. He says the devil, it's his work to destroy the flesh. And so with God, he doesn't, he, he's not the author or source of disease. There's no sickness or cancer or epilepsy in heaven, but he will, as judgment or chastisement, allow Satan to do this. What about Exodus 15, 26? You don't have to turn there. It says the same thing. God says, if you will obey me, I will take all sickness out of the midst of you, and I'll put none of those diseases on you which I put on the Egyptians. There again, he says, I put them on there. But if you want to know, and he, by the way, he's referring there, of course, to the ten plagues. When the Last plague was that of the death angel going through Egypt. Uh, God said, I put those things on the Egyptians, and if you obey me, I'll, allow, I'll put none of these on you. But again, who is the source of the sickness? God put it on them, but who is the source of the disease? I wonder if you know that there's a passage in Scripture that plainly tells us who 
was the source of the plague, the various plagues, and of the disease and death upon the Egyptians. I'm reading now from Psalm 78, where he speaks of these things. Uh, verse 46, he gave up their cattle to the hail. Um, well, verse 44, he turned the rivers into blood and their floods that they could not drink. He sent divers sorts of flies among them. He devoured them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. And he lists the various plagues that he sent against Egypt. God says in Exodus 15, 26, I did these things. Verse 48, he gave up their cattle also to the hail and their flocks to the hot thunderbolts. But look at verse 49. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. You see, the source of the plagues. God doesn't have any plagues in heaven and, and uh, tornadoes and cancers and epilepsy, as I say, and diseases. But he knows who is behind this, and in judgment, he sent evil angels who wrought all of this destruction upon Egypt. All we need, dear friends, is just to get alone seriously with the word a while, and we'll find out that what the church of our day has taught us about divine healing and the source of evil and adversity and sickness and all of these other things is not based upon Scripture, what they're teaching, not based at all upon Scripture. There's no word in the Bible that says God is the source of these things. And some superficial teachers and thinkers will quote you a verse of Scripture, and because we don't know the word, I mean we the church as a whole, then we fall prey to their deceptions and uh, allow Satan to rob us of our inheritance because they can find a proof text that says, well, look, it says that God sent disease upon the Egyptians. And if we obey him, he won't put disease on us. Well, even if you believe that he was the source of it, then why don't you obey him and you'd never be sick? I mean, even following their logic, he says, if you will obey me, I'll take all sickness out of the midst of you. Oh, well, that was Old Testament. I forgot. I forgot that was Old Testament. <laughs> The only problem is, friends, I've read Hebrews. Amen. Yes, it's Old Testament. And if you've been coming on Sunday morning, if you haven't, well, you've been missing it. If you've been coming on Sunday morning, this message of the book of Hebrews is out of the shadows into the light. That over and over and over and over again, he says that all they had in the Old Testament, healing, protection, deliverance, prosperity, were but shadows of better things to come. Amen. That we have a better covenant based on better promises. And if you're not enjoying them, it's because, well, it's either because you choose not to receive your inheritance or because you're bound by a spirit of unbelief. And you can get bound by spirits of unbelief. And I'll tell you where you can get bound by them in a lot of our churches. Amen. Amen. Well, <laughs> we warned you ahead of time that that we're going to tell it like it is. In fact, I don't even dare at this point tell some of you like it is because there's some people that can't handle it. They can't handle the fact that God doesn't even have his eye upon the denominations at this point. They couldn't handle that, so we just don't force that on anybody. <laughs> that his eye is on the charismatic movement. He's behind it. He's inspired it, and what he's doing is outside, 100% outside the denominational system. Oh, you say, you mean no Christians in the denominations, no charismatics in the denominations? I didn't say that. I said the institutional system, not some people in it. I didn't say a word about an individual in it. I said the system is not God. He never raised up a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. He just raised up disciples. But... That's a little strong meat for some people. They even call it heresy. And so we'll just have to, to leave that for now. But the third common fallacy concerning what's provided for us in the atonement is that, that God uses me. Please stop your machine at this point and turn the tape over.
The third common fallacy concerning what's provided for us in the atonement is that that God uses means. They say, you can't tell God how to heal. I've got a scar starting here going around to here to prove that I once fell for that delusion. I was trusting God for my healing before I became charismatic. I didn't know anything about divine healing. I'd read James 5. And I didn't know any elder that I could call to pray for me. And so I, uh, I was stumbling along the best I could with what little I knew about divine healing. This has been many years ago. And so one brother, to do me a favor, the denomination where I was teaching, I got a hold of one of their books and I read a chapter in there entitled, We Can't Tell God How to Answer Our Prayers. And I discovered I'd been telling him to heal me by faith and that sometimes, generally, he uses surgery if it's serious and medicine if it isn't. So I submitted to surgery. So I've got the marks on me to prove that I fell for that delusion. But I haven't fallen for it since, since the Holy Ghost came. And uh, this old idea, you can't tell God how to heal, is just mudding the waters. It's setting up a smoke screen so you don't really see the issue, what we're really talking about. You see, most Christians believe, here's where the whole thing stems, the error stems from. Most Christians believe and a lot of charismatics are included in this statement, that God has two methods of healing. Natural, supernatural. Generally the natural. Mostly the natural. Sometimes exceptions. The supernatural, a miracle, when the doctors give you up, sometimes someone gets healed uh, supernaturally. And the fallacy <clears throat> which most Christians hold to today is based upon that, that God has two methods. And the only problem with that, there's no scripture for it, not a verse. And anybody out there tonight who believes that, where's your verse? Amen. You don't have it. I won't give you five minutes up here to quote some alleged proof texts. We wouldn't let you waste our time. I used to say, I'll give you five minutes to prove your viewpoint, but that would be a waste of time because it's not in the Bible. Say, oh, you mean you don't believe God ever uses a method? I believe God always uses a method. The blood of Jesus. I tell people it's ludicrous for us to think God needs a method outside of what Isaiah 53 says he provided. And then they start throwing all of these unrelated arguments to you. Don't you believe that everybody that gets healed, that God was behind it? Of course I do. However they got healed. We're talking about divine healing and natural healing. We have no antagonism against uh, people who have no faith and have to go to the doctors and resort to those methods. I've said that until it gets boring to hear me for myself. To hear myself. Uh, we... That isn't, that isn't the issue, friends. You are his children, and Jesus went to the cross and suffered and died. It says he bore your pains. He was acquainted with sickness. He knew pain. Well, he wasn't sick. He was sinless. There's no reason for him to hurt, but he bore that for you. And he suffered and died in vain. If you refuse that when you have a need and resort to to man's method who will never give any glory to God even if he's a Christian. Now you just got to face it. It would be a rare exception. When people get healed by medicines and doctors, that's all they talk about, Christians. God gets no glory out of it. And if you know of an exception, then praise the Lord. We're always glad for good exceptions. But exceptions only prove the rule. And so <clears throat> Christians, they, they, they're, they're in the ridiculous position of thumbing through the Word trying to find proof texts for why they're sick. Or why they don't have anything. And somebody, oh, they searched and finally ran into Hezekiah over in Second Kings. Well, uh, to say that God doesn't use method there, methods there, he told Hezekiah through the prophet Isaiah to put figs on his carbuncle. Figs are medicine. Figs are medicine. They say, there, that's proof that God, God uh, wants us to use medicine because Hezekiah was dying of this boil, really a carbuncle. You don't die of boils. A carbuncle is about the worst thing you can get. Gordon Lindsay had one, and he came within just a, hour, a few hours of dying. Uh, and his last word was, Lord, uh, 
regardless of what happens, I want you to know I was healed at Calvary. <laughs> well, he couldn't die with a confession like that, so he didn't. He said, he said, I want to go on record that I was healed. Hallelujah. And so uh, Hezekiah, God sent Isaiah to him and said, uh, put your affairs in order. He said, uh, your days are finished. Uh, God's taking you. Oh, Hezekiah, he didn't want to die. And uh, he had this terrible boil, this carbuncle. And he turned his face to the wall and began to cry out to the Lord and ask for mercy. While Isaiah was still leaving the castle, the uh, palace, grounds, God spoke to him and said, go back. He's praying in there, and I've answered his prayer. Tell him I'll give him 15 more years. All that's in Second Kings, you see. And then he told him, put a, put a poultice of figs on that carbuncle. And in three days, you'll be raised up and get back to the temple. All right, <clears throat> to worship. Now, the significance is, friends, he's dying of this carbuncle. Figs can't heal a man who's dying. The word of the Lord through the prophets, what healed him. He said, Thus saith the Lord to give you 15 more years. That's his healing right there. Amen. And whatever the figs mean, I don't know what they mean. At the most, they were only a poultice. But I know there's no healing virtue in them because doctors don't use them, drugstores don't stop them, and hospitals have never cured anybody of a carbuncle by using figs. I mean, after all, if figs are such a great miracle drug, why don't doctors use them? I've never read in the Bible where anybody before or after ever got healed or was even told, rather, to use figs. Now, Job had the same disease. I've looked it up in the Hebrew, and it's the same word, the same thing that Hezekiah had. Job had all over his body, and God didn't say to Job, get you some figs and you'll be healed. <laughs> God healed him supernaturally, just like he did Isaiah. Amen. Uh, Jesus put clay on the blind man's eyes. Did the clay heal him? Uh, he spit one time on his finger and touched a dumb man's tongue and loosed his tongue. Did the spittle heal him? People today say unsanitary, but did the spittle heal him? <laughs> he told Hezekiah to dip seven times in the muddy water and you'll be healed of leprosy. You mean the muddy Jordan would heal Naaman's leprosy? He tells us to anoint the sick with oil. Is there any healing power in oil, olive oil? We've got it up here. Is it? Well, of course not. These things are tokens of faith. These things help a person to release their faith. When we touch you with that oil, or when he put that clay on the blind man's eyes, he said, go wash. And he went and washed, and he came seeing. It was, it was something to enable him to act his faith. God often does this in Scripture. When the Israelites had disobeyed him and he sent the fiery serpents among them, bit them, thousands of them dying, he told Moses, make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, and everyone who in faith looks to it will be healed. Now, do you mean that piece of metal up on a pole could heal? You see, these are simply means of getting a person's attention onto the promise of God. Uh, uh, so with the clay and so with Naaman, uh, so with the man in London who tells of the time that he was suffering with a severe skin disease, the hands. And God told him directly, if you'll go wash three times in the Thames River, I'll heal you. Now the Thames River is about like our rivers, oh, worse than our rivers, uh, most of them, all of the sewage in there. And a man with his hands all diseased and the last thing you do is ever put them in the Thames River. Uh, uh, we're from Kentucky. You would never put your hands in the Ohio River, at some points at least, that I could show you. And yet, this is exactly what God required, and he was healed instantly because he obeyed the voice of the Lord. When I was in Dallas, Texas several years ago, W.V. Grant, said, uh, as he was praying for the sick, was telling us how that the Lord shows him things. He says he shows me many things. And this is the way I minister, just as the Lord shows me. Some things are secret, he says, not to even talk about them or share. But he said, in this one case, a woman came with, uh, with uh, arthritis, and the Lord spoke and said, tell her to walk around the pulpit three times, and she'll be healed. Now, what relationship <clears throat> could there ever be between walking around a pulpit three times? Now, non-charismatics, this would be weird to them. This would be some sort of magic mumbo-jumbo <laughs> Uh, but I, I imagine that Jesus many times offended the Pharisees when he spat in the ground with spittle, made mud pies, and put them on the ground. <laughs> That's what he did. 
he would spit on his fingers and put them in their ears and on the tongue. You see, there were reasons for that, and he doesn't always tell why. God has shown uh, things to to us, many of us, that we don't always share everything that he's shown us. We just go ahead and do it, and it works. And so the woman walked back and forth three times. Wasn't any better. Still with her arthritis. And Grant said, I told her, the Lord said to you not to walk back and forth in front of the pulpit, to walk around it. In other words, you have to do it the way God says. The walking around it has nothing to do with her healing. It has to do with her faith, her obedience. And when she obeyed the Lord, she was immediately healed. And so these means, sometimes uh, a person will find something like Timothy, uh, the passage and his wine and this sort of thing. I, I haven't found a pa place in the scripture that says wine is medicine or that figs are medicine. And we're missing the whole point when we allow people to quote scriptures like this to prove that therefore we can take these awful drugs and submit to surgery because there's a mention of figs are drinking a little wine. And if anyone would just read the passage where he mentions the wine, you'd see why. Because he tells him, he tells him, quit drinking that water. If you, he mentions it right there. Don't drink that water. Drink a little wine for your stomach. If you've ever been over in Asia Minor, where Timothy was at the time that he was talking to him, you'll find out about the water. If you ever get outside the United States, right in Mexico, you'll find out about the water. You better go by faith or take distilled water, one or the other. And so uh, just a little common sense would deliver Christians from a lot of this uh, erroneous, fallacious teaching. You see, it's all based upon the idea that God has two methods. I'll tell you why God doesn't uh, use any means to heal people other than their faith. It's because he doesn't need any other means than the blood of Jesus. He doesn't need anything else. It is ludicrous to think God needs man or medicine. It's ludicrous. I mean, it is, it's a reflection on your intelligence to insist that he needs that. He does not need it. The second reason that, that he doesn't use means other than faith in the blood of Jesus, when it's divine healing, we're not talking about natural healing, when it's divine healing, is because he wants all the glory. Amen. And I found in my own ministry that if a man or woman has the least suspicion that medicine or doctors cause their cure, this is all they'll talk about, and they will get all the glory. And God is a jealous God. He says he'll not share his glory with another. He isn't going to send Jesus to the cross, put all that pain and suffering and agony on him, and then allow you to give the glory to somebody else, some miracle drug or brilliant surgeon. He just is not going to allow it. And friends, you don't have to tell me that men and women are giving glory to God when doctors are healing them. I know better. I just happen to work at this seven days a week. One of the greatest miracles of healing I've ever seen through this ministry, when they sent the woman home to die, sent her from Fort Wayne to die, the doctor said, we can't do anything. It's a hopeless case. And I prayed for her by faith, and God raised her up and healed her, a woman 87 years old, helpless. A heart condition that was the valves or something were leaking, absolutely impossible to heal her. At 87, she should have been dead anyway, according to doctors. That was, that was the story all over town. Impossible. The doctors can't help her. She was raised up, healed, went back, immediately started doing the housework, the laundry, and everything else. And this husband of hers was amazed, and I'd see him, and he'd boast, uh, you know, how the Lord had healed him, healed her, and all of that. And several months later, I happened to meet him coming out of the post office, and I said, well, we got to talking about it again. I said, that was a real miracle, wasn't it? The Lord, the Lord really performed a miracle there in healing your wife. Oh, he says, well, we need to give the doctor some credit, too. You see, after the uh, traumatic, the trauma of the situation was over after a few months, then it went, fell right back into that old business where most Christians are. And they were Christians, are Christians. But you see, and, and he himself sat there in his living room and said, the doctors have given her up. They can't do a thing. And then after several months said, well, we have to give the doctors some credit because, you know, they, they help a lot too. Well, friends, I'm not against giving a doctor credit if, if that's what you're going to resort to. That isn't what I'm talking about. I have friends who are in uh, medical science, spirit-filled Christians. 
Uh, but I'll tell you, most of them come on stronger than I do. I'm still going to fulfill my threat and bring a team of those surgeons and dentists and doctors up here that I meet on my travels. You ought to hear the way they tell it. Oh, man. Like one down in Georgia, he refuses to take any medicine. And he'll cut you up, but you're not going to touch him. <laughs> and all I did was mention once that I don't have any insurance. Because I, I believe Psalm 91, I take it literally. And he went out the next day and canceled every penny. I said, I've never seen a man come to that position as quickly as you. He said, Brother Freeman, you don't have to pray about what's in the Word. Now, he's a, me he's a surgeon. He's got a lot to lose. He canceled his malpractice insurance. He said, that cost me about 800 a year. And by the way, he ended up getting sued for 100000 and trusted the Lord and he delivered him out of it. I forgot about that. Got a letter from him. The devil really tried him and he held right on to his faith. He wouldn't even go to court and defend himself and God delivered him out of it. Oh, don't tell me this faith walk won't pay off. Hallelujah. It's got to be faith. He didn't say, Can't, should I cancel my blue cross? Should I get rid of my malpractice? He came and said, well, he said, I've got a lot of mad insurance agents. I said, what do you mean? He said, I canceled it all. I said, brother, I've never seen anybody come to that position. I said that quickly. I said, all I did was mention it. I didn't tell you you had to. In fact, I never tell people they have to. I just say if you, if you are consistent, if you're consistent in what you say you believe, then you don't need anything but the divine protection and healing that the Lord can provide. I will say, dear friends, these are the only ones, the ones who will be just this foolish and go all the way that God's going to use in this end time. Some of you are just going to still be playing around the, uh, the, the, uh, the edge of the pond uh, out here when, when things begin to move, and we're going to be just sailing off into the deep blue sea. And... Moving out into deep water where, where you can't get because you haven't learned how to walk on the water. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I'll tell you, I'd, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but I'd rather offend one or two of you and reach the other 900 uh, with, with the word that will deliver you from all of this brainwashing that we've had for years. I'll tell you, dear friends, it's so plain. It's not even debatable. Why, passages that I used to stand in the pulpit and pound and thump and say this, uh, this or that is wrong, uh, like I said this morning on Hebrews 6, as soon as I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then it's just a question, will you take it for what it says or will you try to put your Baptist interpretation on it? If you take it for what it says, friends, it's very plain, very plain. Amen. Hallelujah. And so it is. When Jesus bore my diseases and carried away my pains, it doesn't matter because somebody sees me still limping. I was healed at Calvary. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And those who believe it with me, I believe, are going to enter into the blessing of the manifestation. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. Yeah, one, one sister had a vision. She said, I don't know what it means. Oh, there have been many visions about the manifestation of my healing. But she said, when your healing was manifested, I saw the body of Christ entering into your manifestation. She said, somehow we partake of it. I don't know what that means. I don't try to figure it out, except that, that where and whenever it happens, somehow there are going to be a lot of healings that you've been waiting for. Maybe that's what it means, that you're going to get your manifestation, that new set of teeth. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> well, I, might, I probably lost three or four of you on that one, but <laughs> praise the Lord. That isn't something that's uh, as far out as you might think. That's restoration. He's already doing that to some. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I mean we know from personal experience, not something we read about. Amen. You know, we've got a lot of people here, and we're going to need about six or seven men to help. How about uh, Brother Sarber, Brother Whetstone, Brother Platt, Brother Jerry, Brother Knafel, Brother Kerry? Would you come up? We've got one, two, three aisles. And if three of you would take the cup when we start, move this way, and three start at the back. The first three go all the way to the back and come this way. We can get the people served without a lot of delay. And then one over here. How many names do I call? Five, six, 
seven. Yeah. See, that would be six. And then uh, someone, Tom, you're over here. If you could serve just this section here. Amen. Now let me let me read from First Corinthians eleven uh, as a background for this. And then when I call for you, would you would those names are called? If you're not all here, we'll get somebody else. Would you come and serve the people? Uh, the communion of the bread and cup. Verse 24, if you want to turn there, of 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians 11. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do ye in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Now we've already shown you the significance of that death, a full redemption, body and soul. And when you partake, you ought to claim the full redemption and believe for the full redemption. Now he gives us a word of admonition. Where, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So let a man examine himself. We're not going to examine you. Examine your own heart. Let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many die. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so let each of us examine our own hearts as we partake of this. Let's bow our heads just for a moment and <clears throat> not count this as something tacked on to the end of the service. The whole service has been built around the remembrance of what Jesus provided for us at Calvary. If you have anything in your heart, any disobedience, any enmity, resentment toward your brother or sister, just ask the Lord to remove that and cleanse it in Jesus' name. Let nothing stand between you and fellowship with Jesus and the body. Amen, Lord. We just cleanse our hearts of all that would offend you or our brother or sister. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. If, uh, if you would just come and take your plate here and stand for a moment. Uh, we're all those here that are called for. We need uh, seven, three, six, seven, I guess. Amen. Now we're told that the Lord on the same night he was betrayed took bread and he broke it. And the idea was to show, as he says, that his body was going to be broken in death for them. We read in scripture that not a bone of him was broken, thus fulfilling scripture. So what he refers here to is his body being broken in death for us. As we partake of it, you think of his provision for you, full redemption in his death. Amen. Amen. Someone feels the Spirit moving them to lead in a course that we all know on the blood or whatever. Our services are informal, as you know. You just keep your mind on the Lord and His work at Calvary. If you feel that, just lead out and we'll join you. Lord Jesus.
Jesus said, Take eat, for this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. Praise God. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. because it symbolizes what he spilled at Calvary on our behalf. The pouring out of his blood was the giving out of his life for us, his life for ours. So he says, as often as you drink it, you remember that death until I return. And that death's for us, so let's remember the full redemption that we have in it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, we magnify you, Lord Jesus. Praise your holy name. Thou art worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Right now, just reach out and take claim and appropriate the full redemption. What is your need? Whether it's healing, the salvation of a loved one, a new home, whatever it is, he's provided it. Use your faith and claim it in Jesus' name. Lord, we just renew our faith and covenant with thee that all things belong to us that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. That we have a full redemption. We rejoice in it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Additional copies of this tape, as well as a complete list of Dr. Freeman's tapes, books, and tracts, may be obtained by writing to Faith Publications, Box 71, Claypool, Indiana, 46510.